That's probably one of the most intense and powerful chapters in all of Scripture. If you catch it, if you listen, if you hear, that is our text today, Matthew 13, Matthew 23. And it is Jesus' final words to the Pharisees. You've just heard Jesus' final words to the religious leaders of his day. They will not hear from him again. From this point on in Matthew's presentation, he speaks to his own, chapters 24 and 25. He dines with them at the Passover, chapter 26. He is crucified, chapter 27. And he raises from the dead, chapter 28. He's done speaking to them. This text, Matthew 23, is absolutely unique to Matthew. You ought to feel and see and sense it is no surprise. There are similar comments that Luke includes, but they were at a different location at a different time in Jesus' ministry. So while the rebuke at times sounds different, or sounds the same, this, this moment before the cross, this moment in Jerusalem, is Matthew's presentation of Jesus, and he's done. He's done with his assessment of the religious leaders of the day. Israel had gone astray long, long, long ago, and the corruption had accumulated as it had for many, many, many years. And now the Son of God has come. The Son of David was present. The King Messiah has come. And they reject him. He is the fulfillment of the entire Old Covenant. And the religious leaders of the day said, we don't, we don't want you. This is the assessment that is laid out in the midst of this, for they had gotten to the point in their presentation of the religious system that they, in large part, constructed of self-elevation, self-exaltation, self-service. The religion had, because of the way they were and who they were and how they had presented it, become all about them and nothing about God. And that's so dangerous, so terribly dangerous. For they were given an entrustment to present the words and ways of the God of the universe to people. And they blew it. Christian, you who are followers of Jesus Christ, you who claim to follow Jesus Christ, this ought to be one of the most familiar chapters to you in the Bible. It should be. Not because you like a stinging rebuke of Jesus rebuking and and telling them what they are doing wrong, because you ought to know it because the entire chapter is set in the, conte- in the context of a contrast. Don't be like this. Before he gets to the woes, he lays that out carefully. That's why it ought, you ought to know it. Because religion and religious systems through the course of history, even those that are based on the one true God who made mankind, can go astray. And this is usually the means by which they go astray. Because the entrustment was taken from them and given to another. You. You. Me. You. You if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So what you hear and what you you see here, you ought to own. We're all now the priests before God. And that's important. 
you who are Matthew (laughs) sitting here. Matthew speaks first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Matthew, the tax collector, who was was the ostracized and the one in need of mercy, the tax collector. You would group the tax collectors and the prostitutes in the same category. You Matthews who sit here and maybe you've been hurt, wounded by hypocrisy those who claim to be religious. I'm sorry. I mean that sincerely. I've seen it, I've felt it, and I've seen it a bunch. But that does not fix your problem. You cannot just say, oh, those guys are a bunch of hypocrites. I'm going to go my own way. That won't fix it. That just points to someone else doing something wrong. Listen carefully, you who are still trying to figure this out. God would have you figure it out. Jesus is still calling in the same way he called then, for now. And you need to do like Matthew, whose voice we never hear in any of the Gospels. We never hear a word from him. And yet maybe he speaks louder than them all. You need to get up and leave your tax booth and follow and live not for yourself anymore but for him who saved you. Listen to these words carefully. Matthew 23, of course, on the heels of Jesus just having been tested by them and then he tests them to his own identity. Why is it that David in the Spirit led by God, in other words, as he writes, says these things, the I am Yahweh, the Lord, says to my Adonai. Why is it that David, speaking of God, speaks of another who is also the Lord? How can he be the son of David and David calls him Adonai, Lord? How can that be? I don't know, they say. I don't know. I don't know. It can be only because he's the son of David, son of man, and the son of God. But they did not want to hear that. Now he speaks to them. And we'll move quickly. You've heard it. You could spend months in this chapter. Months, I mean that. But grab the points. Grab them and hone them and look for them in the mirror. Me first. He's speaking to religious leaders. Me first. Grab them and look closely in the context of the contrast. Don't be like them. So he begins, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, watch his audience, it switches. In verse 13. Now he's speaking to the crowd because he's in the midst of the temple courts. This is probably Wednesday. Thursday he would be with his own. Friday he would be crucified. Then Jesus said to the crowds, And to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you. That's an important point here. They had a position of authority and a position of divine entrustment. They were mediators between God and men. Israel asked for that at the foot of the mountain. Moses, speak to him. We can't bear his voice anymore. Whatever he tells you, we will do. And God affirms to Moses what they say is good. They need a mediator pointing to Christ. They sat in the seat of Moses. That's what this priestly mediation role was supposed to be. 
And it's said in Deuteronomy, Moses reiterates as Joshua would bring them in, you shall, and you shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who's in the office in those days, and you shall do according to what they declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose, Jerusalem. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you. And the man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. When Jesus looks at the crowd, he is not telling them, don't listen to these guys. They held a position of divine authority given to them by God, an entrustment to minister before the God of the universe on behalf of them, on behalf of the people. Be careful to do as they tell you to do. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. Oh my goodness. That one ought to be underlined in every Christian's Bible. What a danger. And they were trapped in this. Self-exaltation, self-elevation, self self Wicked spiritual leaders they are. And Jesus says, be careful. You must listen to them. They represent, they present the words of God and their office is such, but don't do what they do. Now he quickly goes through the major points before he says, but you. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and they lay them on people's shoulders. This is an illustration. This is a, a comment that you're supposed to, what do you mean? They, they didn't actually tie up sacks and lay them on people and you walk around all hunched over because you couldn't carry this? They made the interpretation of the law that was entrusted for them to interpret to the people hard, burdensome. What is it you need to do to stand qualified before God? And they took and created and manipulated and added and added and added. And then they added some more in their interpretation of the law. Do this and do this and do this. And then don't do that and don't do that to the point where you were collapsing in an attempt to be qualified to be righteous before God. Because that's the way they presented it. It was all about your righteousness before God. Jesus' comments that, again, Matthew includes exclusively point to this all the way through. Matthew 11, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, Jesus says, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." Wow, there's a profound statement. All you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, he, doesn't, he didn't mean those of you who are among us that have hard lives, and some of you have hard, hard lives. He's talking about the way you are presented before God as if I, I can't, what, what do I bear? They have made me bear this and this and this. And he says, come to me. God has given me this, my Father, and I, and I ask, I tell you, I offer, come, and you'll find rest. They tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear. They lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Not only do they create religious systems that are burdensome, but they themselves don't participate with the very things they are making people do. I grew up with that saying, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I don't know, maybe that's not a popular saying anymore. (laughs) All the guys who were praying with on Friday morning, most of them, I think all of them heard of that. It was meant to say what's good for her is good for him, the goose and the gander. It's meant to say that if you're going to call someone to live a a moral life before God, then, then live a moral life before God. 
You can't be an elitist and say, you have to do this and then don't do it yourself. How many sad affairs can we point to where those who are uber, super religious behind the scenes when they are found out are living terrible lives? I get it. It's terrible hypocrisy. The idea of a one who would offer the kingdom to someone and then not do what they tell others to do is absolutely horrible to God. Horrible, an elitist. You do it, but I, I won't do it. I'm exempt from such things. Point number two. Point number three, he makes, they do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Now, that would have immediately connected with them. What do you mean, phylacteries broad and fringes long? The typical garb of a priest would, would be, and their religious practices, they would use phylacteries. Phylacteries, or tefillim, are these prayer boxes that are strapped to your body. It is a literal interpretation of Exodus 13 or Deuteronomy 6, where God says these commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And then he says further, bind them on your hand. Tie them as frontlets between your eyes. I don't know, and it's debatable whether he meant that to be literal. But they took it literal. Though I don't know, nobody really entered into heart surgery and etched anything there. And they would have phylacteries, prayer boxes, and the rules and the sizes of these prayer boxes would vary. It, was, it became a performance tassels that would hang at the end of your prayer shawl were scriptural out of, out of Numbers, the book of Numbers. But they, weren't, they, weren't, they were to remind you of the commands of God. They weren't supposed to be there for your self-elevation. And as you begin to rock, which was a habit, it still is in the context of reading Torah and praying, the, the shawl, the, they would move. And the bigger they were, the more it would be seen. Ah, uh, how, how terrible. Performers for applause. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces places and being called rabbi by others. They love it. They cherished elevation. Listen, there's nothing inherently wicked about a place of honor, a seat of honor. There's nothing inherently wicked about being called a teacher, a rabbi. The problem is when you want it and seek it and chase it, that's the problem. It's no sin to sit in a seat of honor. It is a sin and a wicked, ugly, broken heart that desires it. I want to be there. I want to be called that particular name. There's the challenge. Christ is always, God is always looking to the inside of you. Now the great contrast, right? But you, verse 8, but you, this is the killer here, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on this earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. Now listen, be careful of context here. He's not telling you not to call your father, father. He's not telling you, call no one instructor. The context here is desire not such things so as to elevate yourself. He could easily have put the word pastor in there, which in the Greek, in the, the term was shepherd. You're not to be called pastor. You're not to be called shepherd. You're not to be called father, instructor, teacher. He's not saying that those are inherently bad. He's saying don't long and desire such things. You must use the context here. Otherwise, you'll walk away from this passage and say, well, I'm, I don't call my own dad father because Jesus said don't do that. Oh, goodness. Pay attention. Goodness. I, I say that because 
uh, pay attention. Then the, the climax of the entire chapter, my humble opinion for you, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is to be your heart, humility, on the inside, and then the outside. On the inside, think of yourself lower than, than you would normally think. Think of others better than you. Lower yourself on the inside. Lower yourself. Humble yourself. That God would lift you up. If I were to finish that passage I showed you out of Matthew 11, like this, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Standing before God was never meant to be burdensome. It wasn't ever even under the old covenant, though it was restrictive and written on stone. But if it's for you a bunch of rules and regulations and you don't recognize that you serve a humble God, no other religion is presented that way, whereas you look up and you see humility. You don't find that in Islam. You don't find it in the multitude, the pantheon of Hinduism. You don't find it in Buddhism, which is basically there is no God. You, you are part of the divine, but there really isn't a divine. It's a humanistic religion. Go through all of them. You will not find I am a humble, lowly, gentle God. You won't find it. He is different, and so you are called to be different also. Now the woes. Now he starts. Now his glance changes from his own to them. The woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Be careful with the word woe. It is not a term of anger. It is not a term that uh, says, I cannot wait till you get yours. I cannot wait till you get what's coming to you. The term is an intense grief, a horror when you see someone destroying themselves, knowing how it's going to end for them. Woe, alas, woe to you. Not uh, tears. He's frustrated with them. And they will get what is coming. He will make that infinitely clear. But it's a grief term. A, 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 a absolute disappointment, intense horror and grief kind of a term. In Matthew's presentation, there are seven woes. Matthew does this many times, the symbolism of numbers. He's speaking to the Jew, and the Jew would have picked up on that. There are seven woes here. This is a complete denunciation, a complete rebuke of the religious leaders of his day. In totality, in the Revelation, there are seven churches. That's not a random number. That's a totality of a picture. So go the woes here for the religious system created by the religious leaders of his day. Now, I tell you, make this personal lest you fall into the same pit. Make it personal. And I'll just read them quickly and grab a point from each of them. There's overlap, but each of them has a unique statement to them. You ought to tremble when you read each of these. It, that's what woe is supposed to do to you. Verse 13, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Do you know how intense a comment that is? I have given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Open the door. That's what keys do. They open a door. 
open the door. What did they do? They slammed the door. You, you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves, nor do you allow those who would. Wow. I don't know what your doctrine of election is, but wow. You can make God's kingdom available or not, Christian. You can, or you can shut it in people's faces. Wow. Point two, woe to Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel across sea and land, and you make a single proselyte a convert. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. (gasps) Don't think everybody out there gaining converts is doing a great thing. They're not. Don't think everybody out there gaining followers is doing a wonderful, beautiful, great thing. They are not. And he looks at them and says, you chase folks down. You present. And what happens? You you perpetuate wickedness. I follow him. Be careful. Where's he going? You're going to follow him all right. You might even surpass him. That's what he says. To where? Hell. Hell. Row number three. Woe to you blind guides. That's that's an interesting combination of terms. You're going to hire a guide. Well, enough said. Who say? If anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple... He's bound to his oath, you blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he's bound to his oath, you blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits upon it. This isn't a game of Simon Says. If you're going to take your oath in the name of God, and that wasn't prohibited, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Didn't just mean don't slip with a an expletive, it meant don't take his name in emptiness, in vain. If you're going to take God's name and swear by his name, you swear by him. It's his altar. It's his temple. It's his gift. It's his. It's his. They missed God in the Simon Says game. If you say this, it counts. If you don't say that, it doesn't count. Oh, my goodness. Boy, let's be careful with that one. Yeah, but you didn't say amen after your prayer. I always thought for years I was praying, and I never would say, in Jesus' name, until I met all these Protestants. And they always said, at the end of my prayer, I in Jesus' name. And I thought for a moment, none of it counted. It's not a tagline. It's a heart line. It's not a tagline that makes it count or not count. It's what's going on on the inside of you. Are you praying in your Savior who is in you? In You come in my name. You come in me. In my name. That's what it was to me. Woe number four. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, Performers seeking applause and approval from men. You tithe, you pay a tenth of your mint and your dill and your cumin spices. 
God said, I provide for you, you offer back. It, was a, it, it provided for those who would minister in the name of God, the tithe, the 10% in the Old Covenant. You knock it out when it comes to your spices, but you're, what happened to you on the important things? You have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. He's not dissing the tithe. You should have done that. I told you to do it. I asked you to do it. Do it. But you're taking care of the minors and completely ignoring the majors. You ever see someone major on the minors and minor on the majors? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. They were missing the person of God, and they neglected the weighty things of the heart of God in the midst of the law. You should have walked away with this idea of loving God and loving your neighbor no matter when and how you engage the law. It should have been the weightier part of it. Number five, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and, and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and, and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. For him, this was a reference to their dietary prescriptions in terms of how they would prep the utensils. But inside, they were, they were absolutely broken, superficial. I love that word in the English. Super above the face on the surface. The Greek equivalent would be skin level. Don't, don't worship God, respond to God at the skin level, and then find out what's underneath is nothing but yuck. Number six, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you performers who seek applause. For you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So also outwardly you appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This feels like the one before, but he's making a comment with regard to the impression that you leave with others. They look at you and they say, wow, she's godly. Wow, she, she's, he's, wow, he's really, he's really loves God. And you, you deceive people by your appearance. Number seven, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You build the tombs of the prophets and you decorate the monuments of the righteous saying, oh, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers, Listen, that's not just a name. This isn't Jesus practicing name-calling. A viper would bite you and you would die. The viper was the most poisonous snake, still is in that area. A brood of vipers, you kill people. He meant something by it. How are you going to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. You, you know, geez, be a good expositor of Scripture. Who's sending him? Prophets and, and he is. He's, he's God. I send you. Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Abel, 
Genesis, he's the first righteous one murdered by a false believer. Cain, he was worshiping his own way. He kills the one doing it right. In the Hebrew Scriptures, where Zechariah's death is recorded, that's the last book of the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus is saying, from the beginning martyr to the last martyr, all that blood's going to come on you. And they killed Zechariah in Second Chronicles. You see him in the temple courts between the altar and the temple area. They kill him. So that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barachiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. You persecute God's people. Read, the, read carefully in Scripture where the persecution of the early church came from before the Romans really got going, and that started with Nero eventually and then others. It was the, it was the Jewish contingency, very much so. Paul, it was Paul's job the Apostle Paul, when he was still the Pharisee Saul, hunting down Christians, condoning their death. He was there when Stephen was stoned and chasing them down and putting them in prison. And Jesus is telling them that. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. See, this fits the woe. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. This is God's heart. He's broken. He's sad. This is terrible. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, and then he quotes from Psalm 118 again, <laughs> That's what they were saying, Hosanna. That's what he told them, you know, have you not heard that the builders, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Now he quotes Psalm 118 again to them and says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they will, by the way, they will be saying, blessed are you, Jesus, Son of God, one day. Israel as a nation. You want to know who records that? Zechariah. And God says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, not bad for Old Testament, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And on that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be great. But in order to get there, it's going to be very hard. Very, very hard on Israel. Welcome to chapter 24. And then the kingdom comes chapter 25. Christian, are you paying attention? Pay attention. You've been given a grand entrustment. Open the door wide. Don't make it hard. Matthew, are you paying attention? Are you still grumbling about being hurt by a hypocrite? He's still asking you to follow him. Walk away from your tax booth of self-elevation and follow him. Amen? Amen.